Did you see her? Yeah, but that's not a that's not a thing. She could have been like a cat. She was like cleaning herself. That's how flexible she was. <laughs> it's why gymnasts always do their routines naked. Right. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we love when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Jaffo Lyman Good. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we view TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at shatpod.com slash TV. And finally, to hang out with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatpod.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing tonight? Uh, Gene, tonight we're going to be reviewing a film that was beloved by me as a kid. I think most people who grew up in the young 80s uh, who enjoyed action figures and toys probably had you know the main character from this film. So I was very excited when Omar, one of our great listeners and repeat commissioners, asked us to take to the skies and review the 1983 action thriller, Blue Thunder. Well, they run in and said, greeting chat team. Okay, so it's 1985, and I'm a 10-year-old lad growing up in the UK. Polite, well-behaved, and generally unversed in the ways of the world. I maybe heard the occasional expletive during those tender years, but really had no idea about the plethora of ways to detonate an F-bomb. I was a fan of American TV, and one show I enjoyed at the time was Blue Thunder, a pretty tame show about the crew of an armed police super chopper and their crime-fighting adventures. Think Airwolf, but less, you know, deep. It's not good guys, forgettable bad guys, and a badass chopper. Easily digestible to my 10-year-old mind. There was some mystery to it, mind you. Dana Carvey played an adorable sidekick named Jeff O. And nobody on the show would ever say what that stood for. So other than that enigma, all very tame. So one day I'm at the video store with my dad. Him and mom are going out to dinner that night. So he wants to find a movie to keep me occupied for the evening. I see they have a Blue Thunder movie on the shelf and my eyes light up. Having seen the blandly wholesome show, my dad concludes that this movie is suitable entertainment and he rents it for me. Fast forward to that evening, my parents are out, and I settle in with some ice cream to enjoy. And boy, did I learn something. This movie taught me so many great ways to cuss like a grown-up. Just a few of my favorite nuggets. Hold your nose, we're in deep shit. That's Evie Cochran, U.S. Army. What's the F.E. stand for? Fuck everybody. I've been trying to get you all night. Why don't you answer your fucking beeper? Let me tell you something, Jack. The next time I'm suspended, so is my fucking beeper. And lastly, the meaning of Jaffo. I won't spoil it for you. Does it hold up? Kind of. The action scenes are amazing. I challenge you to find a better helicopter dogfight out there. The writing and the acting is tight all around. <laughs> Warren Oates plays the best hard-ass police captain I've ever seen in a movie. Every second he's on screen is a gift. And the scene in which he tears into our heroes is worth the price of admission alone. Lastly, the movie is ahead of its time in tackling topics such as the surveillance state and police militarization. On the not-so-good side, the depiction of women in this movie shows its age, putting it politely. Our heroes are the kind of guys who use their super chopper to peep at naked ladies in their home. And the final action scene for all its technical brilliance doesn't sit well in a post 9-11 world. All that said, this is still a favorite of mine. We'd love to hear where you guys come out on it. Until then, catch you later and don't hop, Omar. We've talked a lot about how life has changed since the 80s, especially for kids. I remember as a 10-year-old, you didn't have a babysitter. They would just rent you a video. I'm glad Omar had that experience too. When I talked to my sister, she's like, yeah, I have to get a babysitter for you know my nephew when he was like 14, 15 years old. It's absolutely crazy. Is that like, is that just the thing now? Is that age moved up? Because I feel like a 10 year old with you know YouTube can just entertain themselves for four hours while I leave the house. So it's like illegal for you to leave a kid alone <laughs> before like they're illegal. 12. Oh, 
and the state of Texas, at least every state has their own like ages, but in the state of Texas, they have to be 12 before you legally can only allow them to stay at home by themselves. Is there a statute of limitations on that? I'm no. sorry, mom. No, I would, I would not. I, I love Emma and she makes good choices, but uh, she would try to make popcorn or something like yeah. that and burn the house down or uh, just break something, you know? So I, I think 90% she would survive fine, but that 10%, is why you get a babysitter. If I ever produce offspring, I'm just going to train him to edit the pod, make my own little shop, oh my God. sweat shop Oof. here. It'll be great. Start Holy having them. Sh- Holy shit. I will pay them. <laughs> well, Blue Thunder is a 1983 action thriller directed by John Badham. The film features a high-tech helicopter of the same name and stars Roy Scheider, Warren Oates, Candy Clark, Daniel Stern, and Malcolm McDowell. The spinoff TV series, which Omar loved, ran for 11 episodes in 1984. Blue Thunder was released on May 13th, 1983. It was the number one ranked film in the United States on its opening weekend, overtaking Flashdance. Overall, in the U.S., it took in $42 million for its 66 days of release and $22 million in video rentals. So Big D, Ash, we always ask where you were and what your memories are of the movie we're covering. Tonight, it is Blue Thunder. Big D, let's start with you. So unlike Omar, I never even knew there was a television show. I have no idea how I did not know because I loved Airwolf. But in doing research for the podcast as the dedicated podcaster I am, I went and looked up the show. Yes, 11 episodes. That might be why I didn't see it. But the cast, Dana Carvey as Clinton Jaffo Wonderland or Bubba Smith as Lyman Bubba Kelsey. What could go wrong? Dick Butkus was Richard Sky Blutowski. This sounds like it was a hit all over it. But as a kid, I loved the toys, like I said in the intro, that the Transformers mask, which were like these mobile armored strike command, it, like the Camaro would have the wings that pop up and rockets. So naturally, if I see a show or a movie with a cool vehicle, Knight Rider, Firefox with Clint Eastwood, which I hope we do one day, Airwolf, the fall guy with that badass truck, the Dukes of Hazard, the A-Team, Iron Eagle, Wraith, Blue Thunder, that shit was right up there. And one of my memories was saving up to get a 132nd model of Blue Thunder by Monogram and looking at the box and the details. But as like a 10-year-old kid, I didn't have the skills or the the, the fine motor <laughs> functions. It probably looked like I'd put it together in the dark. But I still loved that model, loved the box, and imagined myself flying Airwolf out there and, and keeping the streets safe. When you mentioned mask, it reminded me of Sky Commanders. Did you guys ever have Sky Commanders? No. It was the most annoying toy for children and parents alike. There were these guys that had these packs on them with like a hook that went over their head and they would attach to lines. But the lines were only about three feet long. So you can only connect them from like one piece of furniture to the next. And the guy would just zip line from one to the other. And my mom would always be like tripping over them. The lines would get tangled in the vacuum cleaner. Sky Commanders, guys, check them out. I, like you, Big D, was addicted to Airwolf growing up and... I know I must have seen Blue Thunder before I was old enough to form reliable memories because things I thought happened on Airwolf were actually scenes from Blue Thunder and things that I thought would happen to Blue Thunder actually happened in the Airwolf TV series. Yeah, I, I've never seen this. I don't I didn't know anything about it. The the early 80s stuff, especially like I, I get kind of left out on because I was born this year. I was born in 83. And so I don't remember a lot of things, obviously, from this time period. And like they didn't come back around. And I get really nervous whenever we review like an 80s action film that's related to toys, because a lot of our listening audience has such connections to these. So like when we did Transformers, the movie, I got really nervous, but at least I like Transformers growing up. But y'all talk about Airwolf. No like never watched it and just in general the 80s obsession with like cool tech so like Knight Rider and all those types of things I was not into and never got into the only techie thing which isn't even the same thing I loved Robocop but like that wasn't like a a helicopter or car or something like that so it was tough but I thought in doing a little bit of research at the start that this was going to be like a kids film like our commissioner and i was like hey finn do you want to watch this with me (laughs) like it's about a helicopter and about you know cool shit like that and he said no after he watched the trailer and y'all i am so glad that i did not let finn watch this movie with me because this is not a kid movie at all he'd be like mommy why are you not as flexible as that lady (laughs) mommy why aren't you able to do that (laughs) Let's take to the skies and hit the trailer. A 
brings you the air support. Kind of like the idea of it. No guns, no kicking in doors, and, you know, just quiet. Oh, yeah. For Frank Murphy, policing the air has its ups. Welcome to air support. And downs. You got a runaway. Well, I just wanted to say, sir, that that was my fault. I talked Murphy into taking us there. You're supposed to be stupid, son. Don't abuse the privilege. Roy Scheider is Frank Murphy, a lone wolf. Freeze! Bozo, how many regulars come in the front door with a key? Who's about to become a guinea pig. I thought it was illegal to arm police helicopters. Well, that would depend on the circumstances, wouldn't it? Columbia Pictures presents Blue Thunder. A flying arsenal that hears through walls, sees in the dark, and thinks your thoughts. Wherever you look, the guns follow. It was designed for war-torn countries. One civilian dead for every ten terrorists. That's an acceptable ratio. Unless you're one of the civilians. It was assigned to American cities. You're talking about ground control from the air? That's what this special detail is all about. They told Murphy to test it. They didn't tell him what it was for. A dozen of these copters and you can run the whole damn country. Who was behind it? Where are we? Federal building. Hey, you want to find out what's going on in there? We certainly do. Wait, you gotta do me a favor. I want you to pick up a package for me. Why they chose him. Uh, he's totally unsuitable for our purpose. Don't stop for anything or anybody. For why they changed their minds. You turn the face over and go off the I never saw this guy before in my life. Come on, let's go. Well, not so fast. That's government property. Give me that. But when Murphy went looking for answers... You got all this on tape? I got every word of it. If it gets back to me, I'll deny it. The answer... Uh-oh, uh-oh. ...came looking for him. weapon and the perfect plan but Murphy stole their thunder police pilot Frank Murphy and observer Richard Lyman good patrol Los Angeles at night until one day Murphy is selected to pilot an advanced helicopter nicknamed Blue Thunder during an evaluation exercise. With powerful armament, thermal infrared scanners, unidirectional microphones, cameras, built in mobile telephone, computer, and modem, and pneumatic video cassette recorder, Blue Thunder appears to be a formidable tool in the war on crime. Okay, so this movie starts off. And one thing I found interesting about it was the way that the music introduces the character at the beginning. Because the camera's panning, you're going through like this little office, and then all of a sudden they show Roy Schneider. And the camera pans up to him, and legit, the music completely changes it's like those Mm -hmm. old silent films where like they would play a different tone for the bad guy and a different tone for the good guy to let us know who they were when they show roy schneider there's this little like chord that picks up and it's kind of inspirational and it begins this journey of like okay we know that like this is our guy this guy is gonna walk us through this movie he's gonna be the hero of our story And I kind of miss the simplicity of movies like this. It kind of reminds me of what we just reviewed in Romper Stomper, where we got their names on the screen at the beginning. And we talked about how convenient that would be if we just like know from the outset who they are and what are their roles. And it made me feel really nostalgic for the 80s because not all 80s films had like the names on the screen, but a lot of them did this. That when you saw the guy you were supposed to like, the guy that was supposed to be the one that the action figure gets made of, like it's almost like he got his little like theme in the background so you knew who he was 
The other thing with Murphy is they play him as super fucking cool. And we really don't get enough, like, (laughs) how cool is this guy roles anymore? It's something I really appreciated about 80s movies. And I continue to love about Bollywood. Like, you watch a Bollywood flick and the guy is just impossibly fucking cool to the point where it's comical. I certainly love that characters in film these days have become more complex. They've become funnier. They've become more flawed. But certainly there's still a place in the world for a star who's just a badass. You want to introduce yourself to the pilot? Too bad. He's doing something mysterious with his watch that's so badass. (laughs) You're going to shit yourself when he finally decides to tell you what it is. Oh, fuck yeah. He he is a badass. And he is that typical like 80s and 90s, the rebel cop who's got a dark backstory and he doesn't follow the rules. And the captain's going to yell at him and get in my office. And he's a lethal weapon. We had Riggs, who's got that dark backstory. We think he was, you know, he had a traumatic event. He's drinking. He's putting his gun in his mouth. He's going to kill himself. That's not Murphy. Murphy is a badass who just doesn't follow the rules. And he breaks more rules and laws before he even gets in the Blue Thunder. He doesn't listen to the captain. I'm not going to listen to your orders. He ignores any (laughs) flying safety rules. He flies quietly into a neighborhood. Seems like every night at 1030, sneaking up and spying on that woman who's doing her naked yoga. He could crash into a house. He could Kobe Bryant this into the mountains. And guess what? If he wasn't there, like peeking in this poor woman's window, he might have been able to save the councilwoman from getting murdered. He gets off work. He hauls ass in his Pontiac like a madman. He's an asshole to Kate. And spoiler alert, he gets probably maybe 100, 150 people in L.A. killed. So so Murphy is not a good guy. I don't know. I mean, he's like kind of like Maverick. And Top Gun, right? Like, and I know, obviously, this is not the military, but I couldn't help but feel like a connection between those two movies, because it's very similar. You got like the hotshot pilot, and while one's flying a much cooler fighter jet, and one's just like a, you know, helicopter. Um, You know, he's the rebel. Like, he's the guy that's like the bad guy, but not actually a bad guy. And he's like this man's man that everybody wants to be. And I think Roy Scheider is actually like probably a badass in real life. I think he's a cool guy, like in the real world. But like, this is such a stereotype for roles like this. I don't think he's a bad guy. I just think he's supposed to be complicated and dark. Ash, you highlighted that difference, though, between a Navy pilot and a police pilot. Like, I don't mind it so much if they're in the Navy, like they're fighting for our freedoms somewhere over the Indian Ocean and not in my backyard. Cops who break the law, (laughs) it hits a little too close to home. Like nearly every cop I've ever met, some of which are my friends, surprisingly, they are happy to enforce the law and like loathe to follow it. They're like, fuck that. They speed. They do whatever the fuck they want. So seeing that glorified on screen was just gross. In particular spying on people right like i've been traveling the past two weeks for work so i watched natural boy killers and blue thunder on flights and i did not expect the nudie scene we got in blue thunder so during natural born killers i was like covering up the screen because i was afraid there was going to be all kinds of nudity in this controversial film and i think in natural Born killers we got like one boob so when it came to blue thunder i'm just kicking back with my southwest snack mix seated between two of my coworkers, and suddenly boom like murphy and lyman good are flying outside this actress's window <laughs> she's doing like fully nude gymnastics or some shit there's tits there's ass i'm pretty sure there was some vag in there it was seriously hot i started to get a boner and i didn't know what to do and, and gene that boner would be justified thank you this is a highly erotic this is right on that edge and it makes me sure that as a kid i never saw the r-rated version because if i had seen this as a kid I would be like, what helicopter? I would not remember the helicopter. I would have owned a copy of this. I wouldn't be watching Hard Bodies and My Tutor and and, and Hot Dog the Movie. I would be watching this one scene of just the most flexible, beautiful woman without really seeing anything more than a nipple. Yeah, I mean, this was out of nowhere. Like, I was not expecting this type of movie. And when I said at the beginning that I was glad Finn didn't watch it with me, it was in this moment. I was like, oh, because, like, why is she doing that naked? Like, what what is the point of it? It's really graphic. I think I have an answer. She is so flexible that maybe clothes would hinder. That's not any true. fabric. Oh, did you that's, see her? Yeah, but that's not a that's not a thing. She could have been like a cat. She was like cleaning herself. That's how flexible she was. 
It's why gymnasts always do their routines naked. Right. No, and why they, us dancers, we just dance naked all no, the but, time. But but I do pose this. The neighbors are pissed. They seem to know what's going on. It seems like she obviously knows they're watching, right? She knows. I mean, it's not a quiet helicopter. Yeah, her windows are shaking. So if she's a <laughs> willing participant in it, I, I'm, I'm going to, okay, I, I, I'm going to cut Frank a little slack. And I think they had to have these cops rascaling around looking at naked ladies because they would have run out of material otherwise. You guys mentioned Knight Rider. Imagine Knight Rider if Michael Knight just drove a normal squad car around. <laughs> like that's what the first <laughs> half hour of this movie is. Other than the titty scene, it's Murphy and Lyman Good. They go up, they spot crime, they flash a light on it. And that pretty much exhausts the cool shit a police helicopter can do. By the time we get to the second crook in the movie, which, by the way, they're fabulously costumed, we've already resorted to dusting him, which yeah. apparently involves flying low to the ground so dust will blind the perp and then nearby cops can just shoot it. But again, why is he a pilot? He's wasting his talent. He is a better detective than anybody else on the entire force. From like 10,000 feet, he can spot... I see a car without a tag. Oh, look, the red beanie. Yes, that's an undercover cop. He can spot any <laughs> clue from so high up. He's not out chasing people like, you know, like highway chases out in L.A. He's cracking crimes. He is like Sherlock Holmes in a yeah. helicopter. Get him out of the helicopter. Put him on the ground. For the record, Batman better detective than Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but is he better than Frank from a helicopter? I'm Probably sorry, not. Batman is not a better detective than he's Sherlock the world's Holmes. greatest detective. He's not Sherlock Holmes. It's fine, but it's in I his don't name. Know. I, I I think the helicopters were pretty badass as like a you know a vehicle of sorts. If nothing else, I think they sound really cool and I think they look cool. But other movies have used them to much better advantage than this movie does. And I think the problem here is the way they shoot it. I just recently watched Outbreak. And you know, in Outbreak, when the helicopters are like fighting each other, they're like tilted forward and then they tilt back and then they swing their tail butts around really fast and things like that. And it looks dynamic. Like in this movie, at least in this first part, they just like go up and down. And they have a big spotlight. Like, that's it. And it's not even painted a cool color. It's like white with like a blue stripe. Like, it's not interesting at, at all. And now Roy Scheider, like, he's much cooler, I think, than the helicopter shots make him look. But it's just a lame way. It's like a kid that's playing with his helicopter that's just like, look at it. It goes up, it goes down, and it's all it does. But I think that's the point to Gene's comment that this is just the squad car. He should be out doing traffic. He should be out doing basic just observing. So then when we get Blue Thunder, the fancy car, that's when it knocks our socks off. Dust him. When the death of city councilwoman Diana McNeely turns out to be more than just a random murder, Murphy begins his own covert investigation. He discovers that a subversive action group is intending to use Blue Thunder in a military role to quell disorder under the project codename Thor and is secretly eliminating political opponents to advance its agenda. So as a kid, I dreamed I wanted to be a helicopter pilot. Uh, G.I. Joe had a Cobra, which I loved flying around. Murdoch on the A-team. I wanted to be that guy. So when I went to Fort Campbell, I was a combat engineer. I was enlisted, but I had finished college. My roommate for my last three years was uh, Staff Sergeant Gregory Swinton. Shout out, Greg. Uh, he went from being a combat engineer and became a warrant officer and started flying Blackhawks. So the whole time he kept pushing me, hey, put in your packet, put in your packet, put in your packet. So finally, the last year before I separated, I had turned down going to OCS to become an officer. And I said, shit, I'll stay to fly. So I went through the whole background check, the physical, the qualification, the testing, and, and got all the way through the letter of recommendation from General Petraeus all the way up to where I'm going to get in. And they changed the rule on eye surgery. I had had LASIK done two years earlier. So they, even though the army did it, they disqualified me. And even though I would not change anything because me getting out of the army, I moved in as a neighbor to Vanessa. If I change one thing, my whole life changes. So I would not change any of it. But the fact that I wasn't able to fly is still one of the big regrets. And I wish that I could have, could have gotten to do it. Two things that make it really hard for me to picture you as a helicopter pilot. One is you're so anal about your like 
wire and cord mm. organization and everything on your desk that all those like dials and switches and shit, I think would annoy the fuck out of you. Mm-mm. Two, it's your height. I Are you taller than six, six? I thought the max, pi- max height for an army pilot was six foot six. No, I was fine. I think I'm a little, I think I'm six, five, a little under there, but I could, I couldn't fly the Apache. That I tried to sit in, and it's it, that was like me watching Rocky Horror Picture Show with Eugene, where I had to put my legs over the seat. So I would fit, but I could not fit in an Apache. So I have a cousin on my mom's side that was actually a police helicopter pilot in Los Angeles. He ran like the entire helicopter division for a number of years. His name was Earl Tucker. Um, he told a lot of tales that actually are very similar, not to the blue thunder part, but to some of the earlier tales of like what these helicopter pilots did and about how they quote unquote dusted guys to get them out of the way or about how they use spotlights to track them. And they were doing detective work from this bird's eye view. And I never really got it because there's some scenes in here where they're so high up. Like, how are you even seeing like people like ants when you're up that high, even in a helicopter? I don't know how they keep track of it, but I think this whole thing, I, every time it would feel like really silly, I would remember Earl and all of his stories and it felt like less inconsistent with real life. And because I think they are a huge part of how they catch some of these people. And I wondered if my cousin Earl was badass like this. And then I remembered Earl and and he wasn't, he would eventually become a preacher in a small town in Mississippi and it was a whole thing. But anyway. Aside from traffic chases, the only time I've seen a police helicopter in action, like not flying over the neighborhood, but really doing something specific was about two years ago. Uh, There was a shooting in my neighborhood and the shooter had been in a domestic dispute in his home, left the home and fled into the street with multiple weapons. And he was like hiding in a nearby park. So they send the helicopter over. It shines a spotlight on him. He shoots at the helicopter and then he runs and they lost track of him. And the next time they saw him, he's up on a rooftop and he's shooting at cops <laughs> in their cars. And then they spot him again. And he's like, ah, shit, now they got me. And he gave up. And I thought, okay, cool. Well, like, this is wildly effective. But of course, being the conscious taxpayer that I am, I was like, what the fuck do they cost anyway? And I discovered that they cost a cheap one. Like a, a cheap one is half a million dollars. They typically are like $2 million. And they cost $200 an hour to operate. I'm like, let the fucker go. Just let him go. It's fine. We don't use police helicopters. Sorry, Earl. No, and as far as the movie goes, I think it's got an identity crisis because it forgets what it is. This is an action film. When we get the helicopters flying around, it's exciting. There's adventure. In the beginning, we get that whole, this is future tech, which is in use right now. And we're supposed to be like, oh my God, the government's spying on us. They can listen to us. They have whisper mode. That's what this movie is about. Instead, they're like, shit, we can't just do you know two hours of him flying around and dusting people like you've said. So he becomes Sherlock Holmes. You know, he's out there flying around. He's, he's looking for clues. But I think he needed a partner on the ground. He needed someone else who he could radio to, you know, collect evidence. They could be conducting searches, you know, making phone calls. It would be more believable if he had the partner doing the legwork. And I think back to Knight Rider and Michael Knight. Every time Michael Knight would leave Kit, the show's less cool. It's David Hasselhoff. I, I want to see Kit. I want you in your special vehicle. And Kate, make her a reporter. Make her an insider in a government agency. Make her out there working with him. He flies. She does a detective work. The movie stays on task. And we could get more of the excitement. Yeah, I think 100%. I think he definitely needed somebody to like at least bounce ideas off of. So it wasn't so like isolated in that way. But I think that at the end of the day, if he did... Like, I mean, the way you're describing Kate sounds like like April and like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Like she's a reporter yeah. that's, you know, doing detective work at Down night. in the sewer. Oh, yeah. But if, you know, if she did, if he did have a Kate or if he had, you know, just a partner that he was radioing in from, you know, way up in his bird's eye view, I think the problem is the one on the ground is the one we would have paid attention to. It wouldn't have been the guy in the helicopter. He's always the secondary character. You know, the detective that can get shot at is a lot more interesting than the one that's in the air watching the shooting happen. 
Well, Murphy suspects the involvement of his old wartime nemesis, Colonel F.E. Cochran, <laughs> the primary test pilot for Blue Thunder and someone who felt Murphy was unsuitable for the program. Murphy and Lyman Good used Blue Thunder to record a meeting between Cochran and the other government officials, which would implicate them in the conspiracy. But Cochran spots Blue Thunder. Lyman Good secures the tape and hides it, but he is interrogated and killed. Okay, so here we get, you know, they're going to get the big demonstration, which is conveniently, looks like it's being held somewhere in Los Angeles. They're going to demonstrate Blue Thunder's capability. You have some military, you have the police force, they're out there, and they put this viewing stand right at the very edge of this lane, this this like mount site of buildings, of targets. And they're going to fly this brand new experimental helicopter with a 20 millimeter electric cannon, six barrels, capable of firing 4,000 rounds a minute. And we're going to put all of the dignitaries, all of the leadership right at the very <laughs> end. Let's say there's the, it goes perfectly. You could still get a stray bullet, put them in a bunker. And I love during the demonstration, I was expecting them to demonstrate how perfect Blue Thunder was. Not a single white silhouette was going to get shot, but hell no. We get to see kids shot, a kid on a bicycle. Cochran kills this girl roller skating. All the kids on the school bus, there's children next to a van with the teacher, like grade school kids, just shot to shit. And this might have been the worst demo ever, but it does not seem to affect them. And I hope we get commissioned for a short circuit. Because if I remember, that's another technological like demonstration for the military that goes haywire. But this was a shit show. Yeah, I think the point was to show us the Blue Thunder is dangerous, that it's too much power to have in the sky, which is why later we see it destroyed. Spoiler alert. And it's also meant to show us that Colonel Cochran is out of control and, and hot tempered, which was really unnecessary because you could put Malcolm McDowell in like a diner eating a donut. And I look at that guy and go, that guy is A, batshit crazy, and B, the villain of this movie. And the other thing they do during this demo is they're talking like they're real horny for Blue Thunder. And I'm not a fan of naming vehicles or sexualizing them. It's just creepy. When Blue Thunder first appears in the demo, the sergeant charged with explaining its capabilities keeps referring to the helicopter as she. He's like... Here comes Blue Thunder's going to strut her stuff. And he sounds like he'd like to, like, you know, spin her rotors, if you know what I mean. I kind of understand this kind of thing for boats, because boats are clearly female. But doing it to cars, planes, helicopters, it's just icky. Hey, see, I've never named a car. I've never named any vehicle like, hey, there's Carl or there's Henry. (laughs) And I think maybe it has to do with some with guys being like afraid of just, hey, here's Carl as I'm grabbing the shifter and I'm working the knob. It might make them feel insecure and they feel more comfortable thinking of it as a woman. Yeah, it takes us back to when Ash was talking about Titan. Did I get (laughs) the movie right? Yeah, that's a great fucking movie. But hold on, I'm I'm really confused. We can go back to the car sex in a second. But why are all boats inherently female? Fucking look at them. That's a... Boats are girls. But why? Uh, Look at them. How are they any more inherently female than like a train? (sighs) I don't know. You just look at them. They're both you know kind of what? phallic. It's like that uh, Big D, what were you talking about? That guy, the what is a woman documentary. Uh-huh. <laughs> I know when I see one. Yeah. And a boat is a woman. You can't well, know what a boat is, Gene, unless you're a boat. Well, I do agree with you that the hypersexualization of cars or motorcycles is pretty fucking dumb. We talked about this with Christine, as you've already mentioned. We talked about the great French movie that everyone should go see. But here's the old guys out there, like, stop naming your cars. Like, it isn't sexy. Like, nobody wants to meet your car. Nobody wants to, you know, be like, hey, look, I ride her all day and now I want to ride you. Like, that is not a hot thing that some girl's going to fall all over and be like, this is Jennifer, you know, and then we get all <laughs> hot and bothered because we get to meet Jennifer. Um, although I do think if I named my car, I might take better care of it. But, you know. I think you can name your car if it's a piece of shit. That's OK. Like Vanessa's brother, uh, his car used to be called Camilla and Camilla sucked. So he would be like, God, Camilla, don't let me down. Come on, Camilla, you piece of shit. Like that, it's okay. But if somebody like names their car like something like it's a beautiful thing, I don't like that. As long as it's temperamental, as long as it has personality, I'm okay with it. Or like a really like, like, you know, like give it like a good dude name, like Bruno or like, you know, Bruce. You're you're right. I, I had a friend who had an Escalade and he named it Rick Ross. 
because it was it was big and black. But it was it racist. Was, it, it really is. But he, <laughs> I, I, whatever. We God damn whatever. it, Roger. <laughs> it wasn't Roger. Roger had a Durango. It wasn't Roger. But as the movie goes, we had a lot of tie-ins to like Top Gun and similarities between this and like Airwolf. But in Top Gun, when when Maverick gets Goose killed, he is devastated. It affects him even into the sequel, you know, 40 years later. It's still on his mind. How did I get him killed? Frank gives zero fuck about anybody. Lyman, who could Jaffo? I don't care. He doesn't mourn for a single second. Jaffo, he's a, he's a dumb rookie. He doesn't know better. It's like his first day out there. He gets beaten up. They torture him. They chase him in the street, Ash, like you said, Christine. It was like, Pew! we got the lens flare. <laughs> They're driving on the sidewalk. I was like, holy shit. He gets killed brutally. Frank pulls up on it, sees him under like the, the, the little like the blanket and goes, eh, and keeps going. There is zero feelings. He's a sociopath. He is more dangerous to the city of L.A. than Project Thor ever could be. I, I totally. I mean, I think it's impossible to watch this movie, like you said, and not think about it like the helicopter version of Top Gun. And I thought that this would be a character like turning moment for Murphy. I thought this was going to be the moment no. he turned over a new leaf and was like committed and doubled down and eventually, you know, tested some Mach 10 jet and maybe died and gets a sequel in that way. But the same way that, you know, you have Maverick and Goose and he becomes, he grows up when Goose dies. I thought, well, that's what happened here. And, and it wasn't. And I don't think he's a sociopath. I just think it made me realize a couple of things. One, it made me realize that I've been harsh to Top Gun over the years because I've always thought that Top Gun was just like hot guys playing volleyball. But really, like it has a lot more emotional resonance than I think I gave it credit for because that's what's missing in this movie. Like that's what makes the difference between a movie like Top Gun and a movie like this because there's this real relationship that develops between Goose and Maverick and when he dies at you, you feel something because Maverick feels something. And I think part of the issue is that this character, this guy, he's just not well-developed. He's a dumb rookie, sure. And we don't care anything about him dying because he's not that interesting, which means is Murphy really that interesting or any of these characters really that interesting? I, I didn't feel that at all. Yeah, Murphy's like the most fleshed out one. And all we know about him is he has flashbacks about Vietnam and checks his watch. And he drives fast. And drives fast. Well, Murphy hijacks Blue Thunder, and his girlfriend Kate delivers the tape to the local news station. Kate arrives at the news station, but is almost captured by one of the conspirators. The reporter Kate was sent to find intercepts Kate and gets the tape back, while the conspirator is knocked unconscious by a security guard. With the force of the city on their side, the bad guys deploy two LAPD Bell 206s. Murphy incapacitates them both, but two F-16 fighters are deployed to deal with Murphy. He manages to shoot one of them down and evade the other. In the process, one missile destroys a barbecue stand in Little Tokyo, <laughs> and a second hits Argo Plaza. So, Ash, you mentioned how the helicopter scenes kind of fall short, and I totally agree. If Blue Thunder had one exciting moment, and this is a stretch, it's when the F-16 fires a heat-seeking missile into a barbecue stand. And it blows a bunch of like cooked chicken into the sky and across little Tokyo. It's a decent gag, but it doesn't make any sense because Blue Thunder dips down low using the barbecue stand's heat signature to throw off the missile. And the missile is going real slow. It looks like it's going like 25 miles per hour. And somehow there are workers inside this giant rotisserie factory <laughs> that know a missile is coming. And then they all run out before it hits. And to be clear, they don't evacuate because there is an attack helicopter hovering over their barbecue stand. It's the missile that they miraculously detect flying through the sky that empties out the building. Oh, where do you get that it emptied out the building? You're assuming because a handful of people got out to the street. Let's break down Frank's thought. Hey, I'm alone in a helicopter in the sky. There's a missile shot at me. Hmm. What could I do as a police officer to protect and serve? Yeah, let me lower myself to a packed restaurant. I'm going to use the packed restaurant as a decoy for the missile. So let's be clear. Frank, he is a murderer. He is going to jail for a long time. I'm not a lawyer. I know I play one on a podcast, but I am not a lawyer. And I can tell you, Your Honor, this is a reckless disregard for endangering the lives of all of these Los Angelonians or whatever the hell they would call themselves. There's tens of thousands of people on the ground who definitely got killed. He is led at least 
let's just say 100, 150 deaths, maybe a thousand serious injuries. They're talking about Blue Thunder being $5 million. He probably caused $30 million in danger. There is no defense for the way he acts. And they make it seem like the gotcha moment. Oh, we got the tape. That doesn't exonerate you (laughs) from blowing up the chicken stand or going around and shooting up office buildings. Okay, you fired Frank on a fellow police officer's vehicle because they pulled over your girlfriend. Besides that, Gene, you didn't mention that he shot the F-16 down. Back in the day, that was like 12 to $80 million, depending on how that was set up. Blue Thunder was five. You know, he intentionally murdered Cochran. He saw him coming around the corner, shot him. He, he is going to jail. Did he warn anybody in the microphone? No. Did he lure them out into the desert? No. He took them into the populated heart of the city <laughs> and used them as target practice. Meanwhile, is Kate all right? <laughs> we gave Sigourney Weaver a hard time over her parenting skills in Ghostbusters 2, but she is nowhere near the level of child endangerment we get from Kate, Murphy's girlfriend. This woman is carrying her child into the line of fire. He's got a gun trained on her. She's just casually holding the kid like it's no big yeah. deal. She leaves the kid alone with her boyfriend. She drives the wrong way into traffic while her son is in the back seat, and she basically abandons his ass to retrieve a videotape and start a high-speed chase. Like, someone needs to call Child Protective Services on Kate. Yeah, and Gene, when, when it starts off, I, I was giving Kate a chance. I was thinking, I was like, you know, is she a supportive partner? Because at first, you know, Kate is just like, hey, you know, Frank, I'll be there. You can run, but... I'll be there when you need help. And she sounds like she's there for him and he's not a good partner. But then I see her that she's one of those people who lets cats run around the counters and on plates and cutlery. And to me, that's a no-go for me. Hold on. As a dog owner, I understand that dogs shouldn't be up there. How do you keep a cat from getting on the counter? Easily. You just, whenever they're up there, you shoo them down when they're little. Our cats don't go on the counter. I had a friend, Michael Poses, growing up. His his mother let the cats all over the place. And I remember we sat down to eat, and there was like cat hair on the plate. To this day, that I, I'm reminded of that, and our cats do not go anywhere near the counter. Why don't you just cut their legs off while you're at it? Oh, you're going to equate cutting their legs off to keeping them off the counter. They're cats. They belong up there. Do you no, have a cat don't. tree? I have plenty of cat toys. Do you have a cat habitats. tree? Yes. Listen, I have habitats. I have you trees. Have a cat bridge. Shut up. And I have a door that lets them out into the enclosure by the pool. They can go chase lizards all day. They don't need to be sitting on the counter. can they climb high? I don't have jungle cats. No, they're happy. (laughs) Listen, both my cats are content. They've lived to a nice ripe old age. They hunt every day lizards. They hunt hunt the lizards every day. They do. I'll I'll take pictures of the carnage. I just got a new gag that I'm going to do at house parties. Every time I see a cat that's on like a six foot wall and be like, jungle cat. (laughs) Yeah, everybody. Yeah, but listen, Kate, after we get past the cat bit, she's crazy. She's a maniac. She, she, I felt like she was a damaged woman that maybe there was some plot development that came down the road because she's putting her kid in jeopardy. Like you said, Gene, the day I come home and my partner is passed out next to Emma's bed, having a fevered dream, acting crazy, I'm not going to go, oh, look, Frank was reading a book. I'm going to be like, get that dick out of the house. Yeah, explain damaged woman. Yes, please do. Her that she takes the abuse, she doesn't question Frank. She no, no, you a- said you just thought she was a damaged woman. That's what I thought she was. I thought she was just in a relationship where Frank treated her like shit. He blew her off, he left her alone, he didn't return her calls. To the fact that she's got to show up unannounced using his key to open the door and barge in and use her son as like leverage. Like, look, I had to take him out of the house. I thought she was damaged. It could have been a damaged man, damaged woman. It's not gender. It's just, just damaged goods. Yeah, she, I thought she was damaged Jungle goods, cats and damaged goods. It turns out she was crazy. She was all <laughs> down for high-speed chases, doing UEs, driving the wrong way to get to the beach. <laughs> UEs? The bitch is crazy. Well, I have to tell you guys, we've talked before about how we've reviewed so many movies together that like, we can hear each other's reactions without actually being together. I legit almost said out loud to myself while watching this, holy shit. Big D is going to talk about how terrible of a fucking mom Kate is. There will be a bucket on it. It will be talked about. And Gene, just like yourself, I'm yelling justice for Sigourney and Ghostbusters because she's nowhere near this bad of a mom. Sigourney's just trying to make it as a working woman cellist turn art rest- <laughs> restorer. Um, and this lady, this lady is your bad mom. 
I, I totally agree with you, Ash. Sigourney, her one thing was she didn't she didn't like secure the windows that her child could climb out of. Mm -hmm. That baby carriage that was possessed by a ghost or a demon. Sigourney is not optimal, but Kate is a bad mom. Her cat was on the counter, so I just want to make sure that's clear. Yeah, it could have been possessed. It could have been a demon cat. We don't know. <laughs> the operation is suspended by the mayor. Cochran disobeys orders to stand down and ambushes Blue Thunder in a heavily armed Hughes 500 helicopter. After a tense battle, Murphy is able to shoot Cochran down after executing a 360-degree loop through the use of Blue Thunder's turbine boost function. Murphy then destroys Blue Thunder by landing it in front of an approaching freight train. In the meantime, the tape is made public, and as a result, conspirators are arrested. So there is something inherent about helicopters. They are not as glamorous, as exciting as fighter jets. Uh, you know, there's limited maneuvers you can do. So they were going to try to come up with the big legendary, the, the mythical maneuver. And unfortunately, it's a loop. Everybody's <laughs> doubting Frank. Oh, there, you couldn't do the loop. They're making it sound like this is like Maverick's inverted zero G taking a picture above the MiGs. That was impossible. A loop is very possible. High-powered helicopters, they can do this. It's, it's proven. Back in 68, Sikorsky, they had a group of their engineers prove it can be done. I know they did it for the movie because what else could they do? Uh, I, I can't think of it. Maybe he goes Mach 4. Maybe they make it super fast. But this was a legendary, ridiculous maneuver. Maybe he just pulls like a special secret weapon out of it that they didn't know about, like in um, Last Starfighter. Oh, like the Death Blossom? The Death Blossom, yeah. I would think, or maybe it's the, a fucking high tech helicopter. Use some tech. Yes, make maybe the, the 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 rotor, the blades fold back, and it turns into like a masked jet, and it flies. Or maybe it does like a transformer. It just like becomes a transformer. That's better than a loop. No, I agree. The loop was super lame. Maybe it shoots a net. Maybe it does something. <laughs> a net? I don't know. I don't know. It's supposed to be high tech. Maybe it's got some uh, like jamming yeah, the device. The net is or, super high tech for maybe 83. Maybe it's got an, a, a directional EMP. Or maybe mm. it's got lasers. Lasers, Gene. That's lasers. the answer. Yeah. That's it. Lasers. Yeah. I mean, this makes sense if you're a fighter jet, right? It's vulnerable if you manage to loop behind it because it can't just flip around. A helicopter can. A helicopter could just turn the fuck around. So while you're looping your ass up there, it just turns and it's waiting for you with guns blazing. Going for a loop is like a suicide move with no benefits. And what shocked me is that Cochran tried to do it too. He's like, well, fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to loop as well. Why? <laughs> Why? And the loop was just one of the many ways this movie telegraphed all the things it was going to do. Big D, you complained about foreshadowing and romper stomper. So I trust you're going to join me on assigning a full fucking wipe to the catalog of hints we get in Blue Thunder. There's Chekhov's Casio watch. There's Chekhov's erasable videotape cartridge. There's Chekhov's helicopter loop-de-loop. -loop, and even <laughs> Chekhov's gun helicopter edition. It just makes the whole movie feel like a gadget fest, but not in a fun James Bond way. Gene, you're forgetting the fact that they just got into this helicopter, but yet somehow they know about the fuse, which they can conveniently use to, to stop taping and then also leave secret messages. Somehow uh, in this briefing, they were told how this top secret videotape system works, where it is stored, how to open it, how the remote wipe works, and how to defeat it. So yes, there was a lot of foreshadowing. Yeah, I think that the problem, I think you hit the nail on the head that it's a gadget fest, but not fun like James Bond. And I tried to be fair because I was like, well, is it just not fun gadgets because it's 83, right? But like other movies from this time, they maybe weren't like believable gadgets, but they were more interesting gadgets, at least. They were interesting extensions of like what technology could be. And this was like, you had like a bunch of like high schoolers, like, like a science fair decide like what they were going to do to like trick out this helicopter. And the other thing, that I think really aged it too was the the theme itself. I mean, we all do research before we watch the movie. And I was like very intrigued to watch this one because I read an interview with Roy Scheider who said that he, a lot of people were surprised that he did this movie. This was not a typical film that he would do. And he said he did it because he thought the theme was like super deep and dark and was all about the invasion of privacy because of tools like this. And, and sure, I, I get that, I guess. But I think it's interesting to 
be reviewing this alongside like so closely to natural born killers because just like how in natural born killers you know gene you and i had that conversation about how it's tame in terms of violence compared to today like it was almost like oh that's so cute you know that parents were really afraid of that movie in 1994 And then you've got this. And I get that the theme is that, you know, the government's watching us, Big Brother's watching us. But, like, thinking about the world of 2022 and what the government actually does now and why we have to keep, like, our webcams covered and when we get these scam calls and what God knows now that I'm on TikTok, how much, like, people know about me like the theme falls kind of flat because none of it is as close to how bad things are today i would love just to have a problem of blue thunder like am i alone in this fuck we're all the naked yoga lady yes like the government's like we're watching and we're like cool check out my titties right i i chose to focus on a smaller but more comforting theme in this movie which is finally in the 307 movies or so we've done journalists are finally the good guys in a Shat the Movies feature. It finally happened. I am so fucking tired of 80s and 90s movies treating my respected profession as the butt of jokes or some nefarious endeavor. So Blue Thunder, for that, I thank you. Really, they're the hero? Gene, yes. there, there was no vetting. There was no backing up the proof, the evidence. That shit was on the air within like 15 minutes of him getting the tape. Would a true journalist just take the tape from a crazy woman who drove her car up to the front of the station and said, hey, this is from my boyfriend, the guy who just blew up an F-16 and shot up the poor chicken stand and put it on the air? Would you do that, Gene, in the well, Lima, the Lima Gazette? The movie was already, like, first of all, it's the Lima News. Uh, the movie's already like two hours long, and he watched the security guard bonk the dude so he knows he's a bad dude. So whatever he's trying to stop is probably the right thing. And also, they report they reported on all sorts of other stuff, like the councilwoman's uh, death and assault. Yeah, that's true. And, and and just as we close out here, I figured out lasers or a cloaking device. Gee, you were still thinking about that, huh? A cloaking device. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that'd so be Blue good. Blue Thunder. One, yeah. It's got whisper mode and a cloaking device. And halfway through the fight, he gets damaged to where the cloak comes off, and it's got to mm-hmm. be a straight heads up dogfight with Cochrane. They could also save so much money on special effects by just having an invisible helicopter. <laughs> oh, look, he did two loops. Holy he shit. Did a double <laughs> loop. Oh, wow. Where? Oh, up, up there. <laughs> There's chickens everywhere. Now is the time when we give our shat score for Blue Thunder. The shat score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get after respective butts. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is successfully slaloming your muscle car through all the cones mysteriously set up in your parking garage every night. And Five Wipes is an absolute disaster of a movie. It is getting pulled off the police squad and forced to reunite with the guy you witnessed throwing a Vietnamese soldier out of your aircraft. Big D, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Blue Thunder? So Blue Thunder, the helicopter, legendary, beautiful. The design is fantastic. The cannon in the front, uh, it is, it's epic. It looks timeless. It's the thing of dreams. And it brought me back to the times when I would fly my NES, whether it was the F-14, the Tomcat, in Top Gun, playing video games with helicopters. It was fun. But as a crime-solving, detective, anti-government, spying, future tech movie, I thought it it fell flat. Uh, I think for me... 3.5 3.5 wipes, helicopter fun, naked, flexible woman fun, uh, but overall, a little worse than average. Yeah, this movie I thought was kind of boring. Uh, nothing really interesting happens except for a few moments, maybe here, maybe there. And it's just not exciting. The The acting other than Roy Scheider is whatever. Um And I couldn't really figure out my score. But, you know, Gene, you taught me something a long time ago when I first started the pod with you guys, which is coming up on three years, which is insane to me that we've been doing this together for almost three years now. But you when we were first talking about I was getting really nervous about giving a bad score. And you're like, well, you know, I don't ever give anything a five unless it's patently offensive. And harmful to other people. Well, this movie is not that. And then I looked back at other movies I've given 4.5 to that not a five, but a 4.5. And I didn't think this one was quite as bad. So I settled it on a four for this one. It wasn't offensive. It wasn't as horrible as some of our other films. It's just something I wouldn't want to watch again. So it's, it's four wipes for me. I feel like I have to punish this one because the assignment was so easy, though, right? We talk about expectations and opportunities. I expected Blue Thunder to be a souped-up version of Airwolf, right? Airwolf was a TV show 
a film version of that should have a bigger budget, more star power. It should be better. So you take your Airwolves, your Knight Riders, your A-teams, all that trash that I watched as a kid and loved. And I expected just a, a degree more than that. But instead, Blue Thunder was like a bad, long episode of a crappy 80s action TV show. I didn't connect with any characters. I didn't really care about the developments. And Ash, like you said, the message was completely muddied. I felt like the part that was supposed to be the climax, the most exciting part, was the most boring. They spent a half hour on boring helicopter stunts that really weren't that impressive. And so for me, this is a crime against film at four and a half wipes. Uh, so Gene, with a four wipe score, that now puts this in the 262 spot with arachnophobia, gleaming the cube, real genius, the crow. Uh, I was not part of that podcast and inner space. Yeah, the crow is better than this. I love the crow. This is like chips in a helicopter. Chips is better than this. Eric Estrada is fantastic. Yeah, and we also need a, a gritty version of chips. <laughs> would, You're the be... audience. You're the audience these studios keep making reboots for. As long as it's gritty and real and grounded, I'll watch it. Gritty Don't give me that, that Dukes grounded. of Hazard bullshit with fucking what's his name from Jackass and Jessica Simpson. I want gritty. Give me that. Bullshit. I want the Duke boys really running booze. Spank bank music video if there ever was one. All right. Well, Omar, thank you so much for yet another commission. Uh, this week's voicemails are dedicated to Ash. So let's go ahead and roll with the first one. Kenny in New Orleans. Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Kenny from New Orleans, Louisiana, originally from the Hudson Valley, New York, by way of Highland Falls, New York, James I. O'Neill High School. Just want to say you guys are doing a great job, and I've been listening to your podcast since about 2020, and um, you guys have entertained me for thousands of miles with my commuting and back and forth to work and all that stuff. Just keep up the good work. Um, Big D, we are from the same area, believe it or not. You know, I know all about the Dutchess County Fair. I had a football game, a championship game in 91 at Deet Stadium. Partied and hung out as a high schooler for teen night at Let's Dance. And Ash, I am now in your home city as a police officer with New Orleans Police Department. Um, I love it down here. I never see myself going back up northeast for anything. So um, if you're ever in town, hit me up. Maybe we can hang out, get a drink, get some dinner down at the French Quarter or somewhere else. All right, guys. Take care. Keep up the good work. So I'm not calling Kenny a violent person by any means. Uh, I've never met Kenny. I don't know if he's hot-headed or not. But I can tell you this, that I feel like I can hear when a person could absolutely kick the shit out of me. Oh, yes. Kenny (laughs) sounds like like he's chill until he's not chill. Oh, yeah. O- Officer Kenny, here are my documents. I'm going to put my hands on the wheel. I'm going to be very quiet. Thank you, sir. Yes. Kenny's a Kenny. You whew, sound like you got control of the situation. Kenny, I'm so glad you found your way to the best city in all of the world. Um, I love that you said that you don't see yourself going back up to the Northeast for anything, not just like <laughs> even to visit, like you're just not going back at all. And that's what New Orleans does to you. And definitely next time in town, I'll be there for Christmas. We'll have to we'll have to meet up. I'll meet you in the corner. We'll go to Molly's at the market. We'll have a couple of beers. Gene maybe can fly in and join us. Also, I know I talk a lot of shit about uh, cops. I will say this, that I've been completely out of line many times in the city of New Orleans. And also one time asked the New Orleans police department to engage in a scavenger hunt with me where they had to ride my moped uh, down a block and they were happy to oblige some of the coolest people I've met. So uh, shout out to them. I've never had an issue down in that city and they're wonderful people, especially when they clear us the fuck out on Mardi Gras. Very polite. Nobody is cooler at Mardi Gras than a New Orleans cop. I have taken shots with them. We dance with them. They're cool people. Kenny, we love you. Well, thanks, Kenny, for your voicemail. Uh, And next up, we have Paul from Middlesbrough. Now then, it's uh, Paul from Middlesbrough. Gene knows me fairly well through social media. We chat quite often about movies and football. Um, I wanted you to tell you what someone from the northeast of England, Middlesbrough, uh, sounded like we don't all sound like those posh people in London, like uh, Colin Firth and Hugh Grant, you know, poncy accents and walking around in suits all the time. That's not really England. England is uh, swigging beer, walking around in joggers and generally getting in fights. 
it's quite a rough place, to be honest. Um, although I don't quite sound like this all the time. I am suffering with COVID at the moment. But uh, that's by the by. I'll be fine. Um, the reason for the message is I listened to your fantastic podcast on iTunes. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but I couldn't give a fuck anyway. Um, and on it, it's got the three. It's got three hosts: Legendary Gene, Legend Big D, and Ropey Roger. And there's three photo- photographs there. Well, there's two blank spaces for Gene and Big D, and then there's a photo for Ropey Rog where he is having a photo taken for what looks like. Um, a competition for Douchebag of the Year, which you'll <laughs> definitely win with that photograph. So if there's any way you can take him off there and off that platform and replace him with our lovely Ash, then that would be fantastic. Ash, you've been a breath of fresh air since you've come onto the show. Absolutely love your accent. Um, love the way you review movies. Love the way you stand your ground with uh, being in the office with the two lads. So basically, you're in a sausage fest of an of an office there, and uh, you stand your ground with them. Um, but all three of you, I love the way that you review, rate, and do the movies. Uh, the way you do them, it, it's absolutely fantastic. Favorite podcast by a million miles. Um, Keep doing what you're doing. The only problem I have is you scoff at the usual suspects was absolutely fucking disgraceful. But <laughs> that's by the by. I look forward to next week. Up the borough, up the Phoenix rising, and even a slightly up the Arsenal for Eugene. Ta-ra. Paul, thank you so much uh, for your voicemail. So Paul is an adopted, as he said on there, uh, rising fan. And uh, we, so I've got to send him out a package because uh, he's been following. And he's already got more insights into the team than I do, which is kind of embarrassing as I've been following them for uh, for years. Also, he's a, he's a boxer. I'm out there in Middlesbrough, so I love to follow him on Instagram as well uh, and just kind of catch up with what he's doing. So we've got a lot to bond on. Um, really, really appreciate the, the voicemail, Paul. What did we give the usual suspects? I don't remember. Uh, give me one second. It was mostly me, I think. I was as usual sour on the taking movie. these great. No, movies. no, I, I was the harshest. I I did two point five, and then it was a two and a two. I gave it That's a two. Not terrible, Paul. No, got two. We, no, two seventeen. Uh, we got it's two point one seven wipe. That's not terrible. That's no, that's above average, Paul. Oh, Paul, yeah. come on, <laughs> Paul. That's that's come on. Cut us some slack here. I'm comfortable, and, th- and thank you, Paul, for the very <laughs> nice things that you that you said. This podcast is so much fun to do because of these two, because we've all become very good friends, despite what one iTunes reviewer believes that the two of you actually secretly hate me and are just waiting to kick me off. Um, you know, we we have fun together, but who our listening audience? I forget. It's a good reminder, Paul, because I forget that the four people who renew their one star review about me every month on iTunes, literally like clockwork. I'm so glad that you all keep listening. Hello out there. We're <laughs> glad to still have you all with us. Um, that literally on the same day of every month, rechange their one star review to something else horrible about me. Um, it's nice to remember that that is not the entirety of our listening audience. It's Big D, who is the wonderful, kind hearted soul, uh, truly the heart of our podcast, which is why everyone loves him. He constantly tries to remind to me that we have a lot more listeners out there than the ones that leave those utterly horrible and offensive things about me and my family on fucking iTunes. Fuck all of you guys. Paul, we love you. So I, I always tell Ash, I said, take the comment from the way it's written and wonder what that person's doing, what trailer they're living in, what rock they're under. Their life what is miserable. What group they belong to. So, but, but here, Paul, I also have to inform you something here. Uh, I'm going to defend Roger in this, and and I'll explain it. We've never laid it out like this, and I think I'll take this chance to do it. The picture on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, that is Richard Roper. Okay, so (laughs) Shat the Movies was actually kind of a play on a television show, which was big in the U.S., called At the Movies. It's the thumbs up, thumbs down guys, right? 
So there were hosts on that show. That picture is Richard Roper. That was an actual host. He's alive and well. He's on TV. He is a professional movie critic. So when we said we're going to be shitting on movies, I said, why don't we call it Shat the Movies instead of At the Movies? And we took all of the presenters, Gene Siskel, Roger Ebert, Richard Roper, and Ben Lyons, and mixed all their names up. That's why I'm Dick Ebert, Gene Lyon, and Roger Roper. That photo is not actually Roger Roper. That's Richard Roper. And then Ash showed up and was like, I'm not hiding behind no fucking pseudonym. Yeah. Well, once again, Paul, uh, thank you for keeping in touch on Instagram. And thanks for giving us a voicemail. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Gene, next week, while on the run after murdering a man, accountant William Blake encounters a strange North American man named Nobody who prepares him for his journey into the spiritual world. Commissioned by Andrew B. This film came out in 1996. On a budget of $9 million, and I had never even heard of this prior to the commission, so it's something I'm really looking forward to. Well, thank you, Andrew B., for your commission. Thank you, Omar, for your commission. And thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com. You can support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information on our website, shatpod.com. While you're on the website, you can also use the SpeakPipe feature to leave us a voicemail. And check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV. Wherever we find podcasts can be found, including Apple Podcasts, where Paul listens, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Ash and Big D, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. Original soundtrack by Neil Young.